final guest today has worked with some of the biggest names on the planet, David Bowie, Prince, Michael Jackson and the Beckhams, to name just a few. And today's showbiz Spengali, Alan Edwards, is adding a few more superstars to his little black book. He's here to share some juicy showbiz stories with us. Welcome to the show, Alan. <laughs> Lovely to be here. Oh, it's good to have you. Well, I mean, I, I have the book here and it's, it's called I Was There and you certainly were at so many significant moments. And it, in, in a way, the kind of book begins at the end, certainly yeah. in terms of sadly, your really, relationship with yeah. David Bowie. It's quite yeah. a poignant moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd worked with David Bowie for nearly four decades wow. and he often used to call me out to New York to hear a new record when he'd made it. And then I got a call from Coco, who works with David and is always guiding him, and said, um, Alan, I'd like you to come out, David, like to come out to New York uh, and hear the new record. I said, oh, great, yeah, I'll come out in a couple of weeks if that's OK. She said, well, um, do you think you could come in a couple of days? And I thought, well, he must be really excited about mm. this album. Get out there um, and we go down to, I go down to Electric Ladyland Studios, this place in, in the village, beautiful big studio. Um, it's about nine in the morning. Um, it's about the size of this room, actually. I walk in and there's a big screen and David is just, it's just me and David. And David's there watching The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, that classic Sergio mm. Leone Western, which is kind of a random thing to be doing at nine <laughs> in the morning and not sort of what I was expecting. Uh, and we got chatting and we didn't really talk about the record. And he started telling me these great stories about sort of 60s London. He said, oh, you know, I remember in So there was this geese that used to go round and crunch you blah, 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 if you didn't pay up the money and all this. I said, oh, you know what, I've got a funny story. Let me tell you about when I was with the Spice Girls. And then we, met, we swapped stories for the morning. A um, couple of hours, it was really great. Um, like a couple of guys in the pub or something. Nice. And then um, Coco came in and he went downstairs and we, in the street, Sunny Dan, he gave me a hug and um, I, I, I mean, it was really nice, but I didn't realise, of course, how ill he was mm. and he passed away within a month or two oh, of that. Wow. Um, and he was consciously saying goodbye to me, mm. but oh. not telling anyone. So it was a very sort of happy, sad memory. Mm. What yeah, kind of had... guy was he? Mm. Very self-effacing, very modest. I mean, he'd come up to our office. We were in Tottenham Court Road in those days. He'd sometimes just rock up um, he had no bodyguards, no one with him. He'd wear a cap and he'd walk up and down the main streets. And what it, his thing was, he used to have a Greek newspaper under his arm. So nobody thought he was David Bowie. Well, he wouldn't be reading a Greek <laughs> newspaper, would he? And he'd come up to the office some days and he'd make tea and coffee for everyone. Oh. I mean, that's what kind of a man he was. I mean, really humble. Mm. But of course, when it came to his art, which was everything, and I include music and art, I mean, incredibly ambitious and he always wanted it to be... And it, it changed every day. One day it was design wallpaper and then he was painting and then he'd made a record. I mean, to keep up with it, um, mm. was a, but what a what an experience and what a privilege to have worked for him. Yeah. Just Somebody very... else that um, you speak about in your book, who I'm a massive fan of, was Prince. Yeah. Um, and there's a story in your book about a flight case. Can you... <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Prince was a um, true genius, and, but he was incredibly shy. Um, I mean, he would be the sort of guy be looking at the floor when he's talking to you and all that. And he didn't... When he went out to the stage at shows, he used to... He didn't want to meet everybody and do all that meet and greet stuff, so he had a flight case specially built for him, and it had a seat in it, and it had a, even a little fan and a little sort of slit that he could see out, and he'd sit in there. And he liked everyone who worked... In the him. case? In the case. Wow. Right, in the flight case. <laughs> I know this is hard to believe. And well, every... he fitted in it. It was he's specially a... made for him. Specially made, and he's, he's a small, tiny, and he's a small yeah. guy. Um, and everyone who worked for him, he liked them to be very dapper, so everyone would be wearing, had to wear suits and ties. And the, the role was we would have to walk behind the flight case and it would be wheeled out to the stage. Wow. And so you got... know, and then he got stuck in... Well, well, one time in an American tour, the, the roadies took it down the wrong corridor. And there was a load of other flight cases that got piled up. And he Fish nearly got flown to Milwaukee a thousand miles away. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he was very, very shy. He didn't, a lot of times he wouldn't talk to you because he just would sort of avoid it. But when he did speak to you, it lasted a long time. He came to me once, he said, oh, I want to talk to you. It lasted eight or nine hours. Oh, God. Um, wow. And we, we ended up at this sort of club, um, Bougie's in Kensington. Like, by that time, by the way, he Lynn changed... Lynn's been barred from there. Oh, I had it was <laughs> right. I've been barred by he, many. He, he changed clothes three times. So, anyway, we're in this nightclub and he's talking to me about Egyptology. And I'm thinking, well, I better, like, make some notes because he's my client and sort of look like I know what's going on, although it's pitch black. So I'm in there scribbling on a bit of paper and he stops, he says, comes over to me, he looks over my shoulder, he says, Alan. 
you write just like I do. I said, oh, what do you mean, Prince? He said, well, you, you write in, you know, hieroglyphics too. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, would, that would be it, yeah. Right, I'm going to ask you about the Beckhams. How did ah. you launch brand Beckham? Well, I can't claim to have singly launched everything, but I met David um, very early on, and I think he wasn't even... I don't even know who was in the first team. He was in Diggs in possibly Salford. Um, and I went round for a meeting with him, and I remember that we got into the place, it was like one up, one down type of thing, um, and he couldn't, couldn't get the lights on. We needed a coin for the meter. He said, Alan, have you got the coins? So we put the meter in, and I David was well. doing... <laughs> David was cooking dinner. And we couldn't find a can opener for the beans. This is... And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'll go, what time's the next train back to London? You know, sort of thing. <laughs> and then I said, well, what's your, what's your vision? What do you want to do? And he said, well, you know, I really hate um, homophobia. I hate racism. I think women's soccer should be big. I want to see it developed in America. And I was, I was gobsmacked. Well, this I mean, is him as a this young is, man. This is him as yeah. a young man. And I thought he, he had this incredible vision. And I'd worked with a few players before then. And normally what they wanted to know is, can you get me a flash car or into such and such a club? And he had this vision. And, of course, Victoria was already um, part of the biggest girl group of all time. Uh, but she was a brilliantly entrepreneurial spirit and she really was interested in business and fashion. So he put the two of them together and they were very much in love and they were just mm. great to be around. You know when people are really genuinely yeah, in love, yeah. everything's happy and warm. But it was, it was a case of one plus one equals 50 or something. And sort of Brand Beckham was like, it was kind of, came, it wasn't planned in that way. And it came, we came up with it in bits of back of takeaway things and mm. like Goff Soap round at... Um, uh, Victoria's parents, Tony and Jackie, you know, and it's sort of it organically. Yeah. And that's, that's why it's so brilliant, because it's yeah. completely authentic. And you work with one of Judy's well, friends as well. Yeah. I'll tell you what's so brilliant about it is that you've, you've been writing all bits down for all this time and you obviously yeah. you know that how important it is for these stories. But, um, you know, what do you think about the new generation that's going to come through with music um, and how they're going to be able to tell their stories? Well, I think that it's changing and we have to, you know, we look at all these great biopics. I mean, the Elvis one was fantastic, mm -hmm. you know, and then some of the musicals, the documentaries and, of course, the Abba hologram. And it's very hard to get access to stars in the way that we could. I mean, even when I was growing up, you might bump into Mick Jagger in Soho or something like that, but now that's never, ever going to happen. No. So um, I think it's the new art. I mean, when musicians first started... Um, and they would just turn up and do a vocal on a record. Then the musicians decided we want to control our art and we I want to make so the whole... I'm so sorry, we could talk forever oh and God. I really well, wish I we could. could. You know but, no, but honestly, <laughs> it's been amazing answer? to listen to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Alan Edwards, everyone. <laughs>